I'd like to thank everyone attending. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank the speakers for what they've already said. I've got a very fast-powered presentation here. In fact, it's the first time I've given this presentation, so we'll see how it goes. So it's on positive peace and basically a very quick overview of the research which we've done. I don't focus on uh, the positioning of different countries on positive peace. It's more the philosophy behind it, a little bit on systems thinking, and then just some of the facts which were found which are associated with positive peace. So this is a lot of slides, fast paced, so here we go. So if we look at the Institute for Economics and Peace that was set up to understand the intersection between business, peace and economics, pays a special emphasis on metrics to develop, to measure peace, and then to ascribe an economic value to changes in peace. So the Institute has five offices. We're headquartered in a, uh, Sydney, Australia. We've got offices in New York, Mexico City, uh, Hague and Brussels. And when we look at our major products like the Global Peace Index and the Global Terrorism Index, this year media reach will be about five billion in terms of the uh, uh, media impressions. And that'll be about over 5,000 different articles globally. And the, di and the digital media reach will be about 800 million to about a billion. So the first month of the Global Peace Index launched this year, we had 1.9 billion media impressions and 320 million social media impressions. So this work is getting picked up. Works, works used by the UN, World Bank, OECD, Commonwealth Secretariat. We do contract research for all those organisations as well. So for the OECD and their Fragile State Report, for example, last couple of years we've developed the risk, risk methodologies for them. We're ranked as the 15th most impactful think tank in the world based on our size. So now Positive Peace Index is now in its eighth year. We measure 163 countries and independent territories, and that covers about 99.7% of the population of the world. So it is truly compre comprehensive. It uses 24 indicators to make the measurements, and it's all aggregated to a scale or normalised to a scale of one to five, where five is bad and one is good. Uh, it's developed by the Institute for Economics and Peace. And what makes this truly original, it's purely empirically derived. So it's got nothing to do with what my ideas or any of the researchers' ideas are on peace, and I'll have a little bit more on that in a few minutes. And to do this, we've got, over, we've got about 10,000 different data sets, indexes, and attitudinal surveys at the country level in, down in Australia. About 5,000 of them we've used in the statistical research to derive what positive piece is then, and from there to determine the 24 indicators which most closely associated with highly peaceful societies. So just move into sort of the, the findings quickly. So this is a quick mud map of the world. So what you'll find is dark blue is very, very good. Uh, yeah, light blue is very, very bad. And as we look at it, you'll note that the uh, uh, Western Europe is the most peaceful, has got the highest levels of positive peace in the world. And that's also reflected through the levels of the uh, peace as measured through the Global Peace Index. You'll note that North America is very, very strong, as is Australia. Now, let's start to look at what positive peace actually is from the way we do it. So we'd use the definition of positive peace as being the attitudes, institutions and structures which create or sustain peaceful societies. And so we've got actual peace, and that's measured through the Global Peace Index. And so we measure three different domains in that. So it's ongoing conflict, militarisation, internal safety and security. So internal safety and security would be the number of police, uh, number of people in jails, level of violent crime, availability of guns, state-sponsored terror, etc. Now, having the Global Peace Index, what we do then is we use statistical analysis to understand what are the factors most closely associated with highly peaceful societies. 
And then we use other statistical techniques now to be able to take those factors and clump them together. And then we remove anything which looks like it's a duplicate. And from that now, we develop the positive peace index. Now, what's profound about that is we now have the ability to take that and compare it to a whole lot of other things to see what the factors which are associated with changes in positive peace. And also, you can get the momentum of countries to see how they're going over time. Are they improving or are they deteriorating? And so are they moving in a vicious cycle? or are they moving in a positive cycle? So now, when we come down and we start to look at positive peace, and we take the index, we find it's associated with a whole lot of other things which we think are important, like higher levels of uh, per capita income, societies which are much, much more resilient, uh, ones which have got better environmental outcomes, uh, as measured through Yale indexes and such, and also higher levels of well-being and also perform much better on factors of development such as the Millennium Development Goals. So as you take these factors and bring them together, it comes out into eight different pillars. And so they're up on the screen there, but I'll just repeat them quickly. Well-functioning government, equitable distribution of resources, strong business environment, free flow of information, good relationships with neighbours, higher levels of human capital, acceptance of the rights of others, very importantly, low levels of corruption. So these all come together and they work as a system. So it's systemic in the way that it operates. And what this means is it's very, very hard to pull one factor out as actually being the causal factor on another, which we'll now come to. So let's start to think just quickly about systems thinking, because it plays right through the concepts of positive peace and the way it operates. So there are systems inside systems inside systems. And you can think of your body, for example. It's a system and it's got bounds. So if you think we've got the biological sphere into which the human systems were inside, then if we look inside the human systems, you've got a whole range of other, other systems like an education system, a policing system. And then further down, you've also got other systems like it can even be down to the household level. A family operates as a system. And so what happens in systems thinking, super systems can be influenced by even the most basic subsystems. And think of your body as an analogy for this. And so the systems approach, and if you start to now think of society as being a system, and we look at the biggest problems confronting our age, they're global in nature, and they're mainly sort of climate change, ever decreasing biodiversity, full use of the fresh water on the planet, and other such things. And so if we can start to view societies as systems, we've naturally got a philosophical base to be able to fix and move within the big challenges of our age. So now if we start to think about just system, about causal thinking, and we'll just say so cause and effect. And if we look at the way societies operate, we, and you watch governments, and quite often the way we operate ourselves, even in our businesses. We find a problem, we look for the cause, we go back and try and fix the cause, and that is the solution to the problem. But systems don't really work that way. And now, what I want you to, th and systems don't really work that way, they've got feedback loops, so they're continuously modifying the inputs which are coming in, so they adjust and fit within the system. And sort of causal thinking, it's built right into our very DNA. We can walk because of physics. So in physics, the cause and effect are separate. So you have the cause and the effect, but the effect never influences the cause. And what that means is you can take things and you can break them down into smaller and smaller and smaller chunks to understand them. And that's the basis of empiric science. But systems don't work that way. The, the sum is always greater than each of the component parts. Think of your body because you're conscious, and you're conscious is much more than the sum of any one of those parts. So I'll keep moving, well, this is really quite complex stuff. So if we start to think about the, about the relationships and we look in the causal world, you've got an input, you run an experiment, it's got an output, and then that's repeatable. You can do it again and again and again, and it's the same. But systems aren't like that, and well, let's, in society, see this. So let's think about me talking here. As I'm talking, I'm influencing everyone in the room. But all of you will react differently based on your background knowledge, 
what you think of me, or maybe even your moods on the day. And as I'm talking, the amount of time I'll keep talking will vary depending on how interested I think you are. So that's a, just a very simple example of a, future, of a mutual feedback loop which is going on now. So now if we start to think about systems. There's a concept of homeostasis. Systems want to stay, the, want to maintain a balance. So when we get hot, we sweat. When we get cold, we shiver. It's a very, very simple example of homeostasis within us. And so what creates the homeostasis is encoded norms. Systems also have intent. So that defines your system. So what you have is input into the system. It comes in and is it within the bounds, the encoded norm? If so, there's no action. If it's outside, then the system creates a response. And that then goes back and alters the input. And that's the basis of a feedback loop, just the very basis. So crime spikes, we put more police on the street, arrest more people, put them into jail. There's an epi epidemic, breaks out, we mobilise health resources to solve the epidemic and move on. But systems aren't static, they change over time. And so what happens was they change over time, fairly complex diagram here, but we'll forget that. So what happens when you start to get the inputs into the system and the responses only then exaggerate the input coming into the system, this is what's known as a positive feedback loop. But in a lot of ways, it really can be quite dangerous. So at that point then, the system needs to modify itself to be able to adjust to the differential with the input and that we call self-modification. So if you look within societies, this is going on all the time. It's going on all the time. And so you've got this process of homeostasis slightly changing and systems becoming more and more complex, as we can see in our societies as they've advanced over, let's say, the last thousand years. Now I'm going to stop on the systems thinking there because if this is just scratching the surface, but I just wanted to give you a feel of where it's at. So now, this, if we look at positive peace over the last, uh, uh, since 2005 to 2017, this is the trend. You'll note up to 2013, going down is good, it had been improving. Since then, it's pretty much plateaued. And that now seems like it's a trend, but these trends of plateauing won't stay forever. It'll either break in one direction or another. Now, as we start to look at it, over the uh, period from 2005 onwards, we'll find that all the pillars have improved except low levels of corruption. It's the only one to deteriorate. And when we look deep inside that, there's a concept of fractionalised elites, and that's the thing which has actually pulled that measure down. Now, if we start to look at the, uh, the different regions of the world, all the regions from 2005 to 2017 have proved, improved except North America, and that's true for both Canada and the US. So both, both those countries and, and the Middle East and North Africa. We now start to come along and we start to uh, look at the, uh, the annual percentage changes over that period. We can break it up into two sections, 2005 to 2012, 2013 to 2017. You'll note that only uh, from 2005 to 2012, only two of the pillars actually deteriorated. But as we move through to 2013 to 2017, we can find that the, it's much worse performance. And so this is what's associated with that levelling off, but this has got profound consequences as we move forward. So now, if we now start to look at the US and how does it look compared to the world in the 2005 to 2017 period, you'll note that it only improved on two pillars, high levels of human capital, and a lot of that was because an increased rate of high school graduation and good relationships with neighbours, although that may be changing in the, in, in the year we're in at the moment. So whereas with the world, you only had the one pillar which deteriorated. Now if we look at Europe, you're going to find a very, very similar sort of pattern with Europe. So if we look at Europe since 2005, we can see that it's also, in, in a number of its pillars, it's also declining as well compared to the global average. And this sort of sets the scene for what we're seeing play out 
in Western democracy today. And I won't spend, I could go into this in a lot of detail, but I won't because of the nature of time. So let's now start to look at some of the things which are associated with positive peace. So if we look at full democracies, they perform best on positive peace, far, far better than others. Flawed democracies are next, followed by hybrid regimes and then authoritarian. But there's only 23 full democracies in the world. The US is no longer rated as a full democracy. Uh, this is measurements coming out of the Communist Intelligence Unit in London, and it would have been, I think, a year before last that they moved the US back to a flawed democracy. So now let's have a look at high at, uh, incomes. So high incomes in positive peace countries, a high positive peace countries are much higher than the other levels which we'll find as well for low. So we'll look now look at some of the benefits which are coming out of positive peace. So for every 1% improvement in the positive peace index, you get a 2.9% higher GDP growth rate. And this was from 2005 to 2016. And so what we find is with positive peace, it's actually a predictor of future changes in uh, year six macroeconomic indicators. So they're things like inflation rates, interest rates, GDP growth, uh, exchange rates, foreign direct investment, and for foreign debt, foreign credit ratings. So what that means is you can actually use positive peace to look at what the likely economic future of a country can be. So just to highlight that a little bit more, so if we're looking at credit, credit ratings, you're looking at Standard & Poor's or Moody's, they've got 18, 18 different points on their scales. And so what we found from 2010 to 2016, countries which were deteriorating in positive peace dropped four and a half points on those scales. So that is a substantial amount, whereas the countries which were improving in positive peace, their credit ratings stayed the same or actually improved. If we start to look at natural disasters, and this is for a measure of resilience, and I'll have two different slides on that now. What we find is that in countries which are high in positive peace compared to ones which are low, you have about the same number of natural disasters. But what we find is that death rate in high positive peace countries is one the, is, is the, sorry, the, the death rate in countries which are low on positive peace is 13 times higher than the countries with high positive peace, and that comes back to the whole relationship to wealth, the ability of societies to organise and be coherent, and to be able to set the right standards, such that in, let's say, an earthquake, buildings don't implode. Now, if we start to now come and look at the forms of resilience, countries which are high in positive peace don't suffer from genocides, nor violent political upheavals. You do find that there are some political shocks, but nowhere to the same level. So in many ways, positive peace is a measure of resilience, and we've got a lot, for, a lot more research going on resilience and ecological shocks which are going to happen, and then the ability of countries to be able to handle those ecological shocks. So we'll have research coming on out that in about January time frame, I think. Similarly, if we start to look at another way of looking at resilience is, is we look at civil resistance movements. Countries which are high in positive peace have less civil resistance movements. They last for a shorter amount of time, more moderate in their aims, and far, 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 far less violent. So now, just about at the end of the presentation, and then I'm going to take some questions. So this divides the countries of the world up into three different groups. And then it takes each of the pillars and looks at the statistical significance of each of those pillars. And what you'll find, that a number of them are highly statistically significant in low levels of peace. But then as you move into the mid-levels of peace, they tend to drop off. That's not that, that's not that they're important, it's just the statistical significance is not quite as strong. And then as you move into high peace societies, all of them become very, very important. And I think the message, the key message out of this slide, is that at different stages of peace, the activities and actions you have to do are different. And so what this means in many ways, and comes back to a lot of systems thinking, in concept of the path dependency, all societies are on their right path. 
And as we heard Francis say earlier on, you could see the uniqueness of Latin America. So in terms of understanding what to do within a country, you have to understand the system for where it's at and what are the best interventions which will be unique for that system to get advancement. So now, if you can measure and analyse peace, you understand the factors which create peace. If you can measure and analyse peace, you also understand the value of that lost opportunity. And this, are, this is now is actionable. It gives us better predictions, better cost-benefit analysis, and better program outcomes. And so that is the end of the presentation. And